Scripture reading this morning is Acts chapter 9. It is the account of the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Acts, the ninth chapter, beginning in chapter 1, or verse 1, rather, 9-1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. Laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. And there is the life-turning and life-changing event of the Apostle Paul turned from Saul to Tarsus. And that is the word of the Lord, and we are to receive it as such. Let's ask the Lord's blessing then on the ministry of his word as we come once again to 2 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul tells us a bit more about the lessons that he learned from the Lord. Father, we turn to your word now. We ask that your spirit would give us insight, that you would by him enlighten our minds, that we might understand your truth and believe it. We pray, Father, that you would teach us the lesson that you taught the Apostle Paul, that when we are weak, it is then that we are strong because your power is perfected in weakness. And so, Father, we pray that we would um, give heed, careful heed, to your word and that you would bless us in it. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I had thought about speaking to you this morning about uh, 
a topic I guess I would call angels, holy and unholy, specifically based on these scriptures. But we're going to wait and uh, consider for one more time this vital lesson of when we are weak, then we are then we are strong. But the scriptures that relate to the angels' topic uh, include Hebrews 1.14, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? That's us, right? And then Revelation 12, this would be more on the unholy angel side. There was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And... uh, If you've been following along our midweek broadcast of the study of the book of Revelation, why we've we've talked about those passages before then as well. But that would be, that's a subject that I hope you find very encouraging to you, one that we probably don't think about that often. And, uh, And also it can make us wiser in regard to the tactics of the enemy when he comes then uh, against us. But as I said, we want to consider one more time this morning this great truth, when I am weak, then I'm strong, that God's power, as Paul puts it, is perfected in weakness. And then as we've seen already, and we'll see again this morning from Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. This is a hard lesson to learn, and there's only one way to learn it, and that's the hard way. And the Lord teaches us this lesson. He teaches his, his people. And he's always done this right on down through the history of, of his church. And I hope that each one of us is, is learning it um, ourselves. And really, it's an, it's an ongoing uh, work in us. Uh, Not only do we have to learn this in regard to our justification, but it continues to be the way the Lord works in his people in sanctification. Listen again, then. Here's the key passage for this series that we've been looking at, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, this is characteristic of the Lord to bring his people into impossible situations. If you are a a brand new Christian, if you're genuinely born again and you know the Lord, you're a new Christian, it's going to happen to you. The Lord deals with us in this manner. And if you have been a Christian for a longer period of time, then to one degree or another, you've you've experienced this. And to the degree that we haven't learned it as fully as we need to, His chastising uh, arm that teaches us is going to continue then to to work in us. Here is a great passage that that speaks of this principle. It's in Zechariah chapter 4. Now Zechariah, along with the prophet Haggai, uh, was a prophet um, in the time uh, when the Jews were still in captivity 
Some had come back <coughs> to the land already, and they were to build, to rebuild the temple, and it looked absolutely impossible. There were enemies all around this. How could it, how could it even be, be done? And so they had, as Haggai says, they had started to kind of settle in started to build houses for themselves and suddenly things weren't going real well for them. And so the Lord sends Haggai and said, well, I see you have time to build houses for yourselves. Pretty fancy houses here. What about my house? Time to get with it. And Zerubbabel, or Zechariah gives Zerubbabel, who's of the Davidic line, the, the kingly line, um, and the people encouragement and here's what he says and it comes in this strange vision Zechariah 4 beginning in verse 1 then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who is awakened from his sleep he said to me what do you see and I said I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with its bowl on the top of it and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said, Don't you know? Do you not know? what these are and I said no my lord then he said to me this is the word of the lord to Zerubbabel saying not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the lord of hosts what are you O great mountain before Zerubbabel you will become a plain and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace grace to it now what does this all mean rebuilding the temple looked like an impossible job this the mountain the great mountain represents all the opposition to it that made the jews conclude this thing the time hasn't come for us to rebuild the temple then uh, of the lord but the lord through this vision is telling zechariah a message that he's to proclaim to all, all the people is that you're looking at this the wrong way. I'm going to be the one that brings down that mountain and the house, my house will be built up by my power, not by yours. So that when it's done, everyone will stand and say grace, grace to it. it the whole thing is grace. We can't believe this happened, but it's done. The top stone is on. Listen to good old Matthew Henry comment on this and explain it to us. Uh, I can't do better than him. So here's what he said about this vision and the lessons in it. His candlestick had one bowl or common receiver on the top into which oil was continually dropping. And from it, by seven secret pipes or passages, it was diffused to the seven lamps. So that without any further care by man, they received oil as fast as they wasted, as fast as they used it up. He makes a comment interesting there about the origin of the term fountain pen. You can look into that somewhere yourself. But they never, these lamps, they never lack they never wanted they were never glutted they never had too much and so kept always burning clearly <clears throat> and the bowl too it was continually supplied without any care or attendance of man for he saw two olive trees one on each side of the candlestick that were so fat and fruitful <clears throat> that of their own accord they poured plenty of oil continually into the bowl, which by two larger pipes dispersed the oil to the smaller ones and so to the lamps. So that no one needed to attend this candlestick to furnish it with oil. It didn't wait for man 
He didn't wait for the sons of men, the scope of which is to show us, the purpose of this passage is to show us that God easily can and often does accomplish his gracious purposes concerning his church by his own wisdom and power without any art or labor of men. And that though sometimes he makes use of instruments like us, yet he neither needs them nor is tied to them, but can do his work without them and will rather than it shall be and, and will rather than it shall be undone. God will carry on and complete this work as he had begun their deliverance from Babylon, not by external force, but by secret operations and internal influences upon the minds of men. He says this, <clears throat> who is the Lord of hosts, and he could do it by force. He has legions at his command. But he will do it, he says, not by human might or power, but by his own spirit. What is done by his spirit is done by might and power, but it stands in opposition to visible force. Israel, for example, was brought out of Egypt and into Canaan by might and power, and it was very visible then is what he means to, to everyone. In both of these works of wonder, great slaughter was made. But the captives would be brought out of Babylon and into Canaan the second time by the spirit of the Lord of hosts, working upon the spirit of Cyrus, the, the ruler, and inclining him to proclaim liberty to them, and working upon the spirits of the captives and inclining them to accept the liberty offered them. It was by the spirit of the Lord of hosts that the people were excited and animated, motivated to build the temple. And therefore, they're said to be helped by the prophets of God because they, the prophets, as the spirit's mouth spoke to their hearts. It was by the same spirit that the heart of Darius, the ruler of the Medes and Persians, was inclined to favor and further that good work and that the sworn enemies of it were infatuated with their counsel so that they couldn't hinder it as they designed. Notice then, Matthew Henry will do this when he's going to make application. Note, the work of God is often carried on very successfully when yet it is carried on very silently. That's like one of those statements we ought to plaster on the wall here, right? <clears throat> Uh, nothing's happening here. That's Elijah's mistake. I alone am left. The work of God is often carried on very successfully, when yet it is carried on very silently, and without the assistance of human force. The gospel temple, and he means by that, the church, Christ's church, is built not by might or power, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not fleshly, but by the spirit of the Lord of hosts, whose work on men's consciences is mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Thus the excellency of the power is of God and not of man. When instruments fail, let us therefore leave it to God to do his work himself by his own spirit. And finally, all the difficulties <clears throat> and oppositions that lie in the way of rebuilding the temple shall be gotten over and removed, even those that seemed insuperable. <clears throat> Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. See here then, first, how the difficulty is represented. It is a great mountain, impassable, <clears throat> immovable, a heap of rubbish like a great mountain which must be gotten away or the work simply can't go on. The enemies of the Jews are proud and hard as great mountains, but when God has work to do, the mountains that stand in the way of it shall dwindle into molehills. For you see here, secondly, how these difficulties are despised who are you, O great mountain? 
Who are you, O enemies of the people? You remember in Ezra and Nehemiah how uh, the enemies conspired constantly against the rebuilding of the temple and the city walls. Who are you, O great mountain, that you should stand in God's way and think to stop the progress of his work? Who are you that look so big, that thus threaten and are thus feared? Before Zerubbabel, when he is God's agent, you will become a plain. All difficulties shall vanish and all the objections be gotten over. Every mountain and hill shall be brought low when the way of the Lord is to be prepared. Faith will remove mountains and make them plains. Christ is our Zerubbabel. Mountains of difficulty were in the way of his undertaking, but before him they were all leveled. Nothing is too hard for his grace to do. There's wonderful lessons for us. Search the scriptures. You will not find one single child of Abraham, one single child <coughs> of God in the entire Bible who, who was not dealt with and taught these lessons when you are weak, then you are strong, then by the Lord. And the way that he does it is he brings us in and through trials. And then maybe after a bit of a respite, at, as in Pilgrim's Progress, the interpreter's house or Gaius's house, then we move on again and we come then to the, ne to the next trial. My power is perfected in weakness. I would say many, and it may not be an exaggeration to say most, People today who profess to know Christ don't know any of these things. I know I, I didn't early in my Christian life, but the, the Lord set about to teach me and he's still, he's still teaching me. When I am weak, then I am, then I am strong. I went through, <clears throat> I've talked enough about my seminary years that you you've got to wonder every time I bring it up well what'd you go then for you know well that was the thing to do I guess but but um, I I can tell you that in the what five years that I was there never once was this truth or this vital lesson ever taught the problem so much of the time, and I hope there are exceptions here and there, but so much of the time what happens in, in seminaries, and then it comes down, diffuses down to the churches, is that the pursuit becomes academic, academia, facts, and, and, and so forth. But these powerful spiritual truths that are really at the heart of following Christ are missed. And so we see the errors, the widespread errors in the churches today then as a, as a result. What happens is we set out, and I'm sure at times in the past, I hope I'm not guilty of it anymore, but in times in the past, I'm sure I've been guilty of this. Uh, we end up building what looks like a, a great work for the Lord but it's just wood, hay, and stubble. That's all it is because it's a product then of, of the flesh. You know, um, when I was going through seminary, I suppose a lot of it is still abounding today, but the big thing then was church growth, church growth, church growth. You gotta do vision casting and they had all these, all these catchphrases and, and so forth and, and uh, <clears throat> have seminars, conferences, classes, church growth. And they would do things, are, I mean, as foolish as it sounds, they would actually teach in sincerity, right? Bring in some expert uh, and, uh, and say, now look, if your church has got to grow, you got to have at least this many inches of space 
in the pews. Because if people are too crammed in there, <clears throat> they're just not going to come. I mean, they, they've got to have space. You've got to give them space. Well, we got space. We got lots of space here. This is a crowd for us. And <clears throat> they're still not coming. All right? So what, what is the, what's the issue here, you see? But those are the, the errors that come. Look, that's what happens when we think it's up to us. It's, it's our power. It's our strength. And God repeatedly through Scripture is saying, no, it's not. No, it's not. And if you really belong to me, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you these lessons. Consider again some more examples here. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 4. But we have this treasure, the gospel, in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now there's a lot more there that <clears throat> not only do we not have time to cover this morning, there's a lot more there that I don't even fully understand yet. But this much I do know. We are clay pots. We are <clears throat> just dirt <laughs> fashioned into pots in which a treasure is, is entrusted. That is the gospel. Paul means here that the Lord chooses to work through the weakness of man. Paul was weak outwardly. He wasn't always weak outwardly. But after that experience there of getting laid low by Jesus on the Damascus Road, Paul was weak outwardly. He was not exalted. He was demeaned. He was persecuted. He wasn't embraced and accepted. He wasn't a celebrity. He was maligned and slandered and hated. And he tells us, it, look, it was the Lord that was doing this because the Lord chooses to work through lowly, despised instruments. Think of this. Why would anyone put an invaluable treasure, a jewel, a gem of some kind, in an old broken clay pot. Well, why, why would you do that? Humanly speaking, you, you, never, you never would. Why would you put this treasure that really looks like, well, you, don't you want everybody to see it? Well, why would you put it in a, in a clay pot that no, nobody's gonna walk by and see, ooh, Look at that pot. I've got to get hold of that. I want to, I want to see what's in, inside there, you see. There wasn't anything about the pot, about Paul, that would attract anyone to it or the treasure in sight. In fact, the only reason anyone is ever going to find the treasure, is ever going to look inside, is because the Spirit of God comes upon them in power and compels them to do so. Why are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? It's not because, well, you know, I just decided one day I'm going on a search and I came across these people and they're fools and they had a stench of death and the message that they preached was foolishness. But you know what? In spite of all that, I decided I'm going to look in the pot. I'm going to look further. And I found the treasure. Is that how you were saved? If that's how you were saved, 
Either you grossly misunderstand what's happened to you in Christ, or you need to examine yourself to see whether you're really a Christian or not. What happened was God grabbed hold of you while you were still dead in your sins, and he raised you up. He said, you, get out of the tomb, come forth. I'm taking you over here to this clay pot. There's a treasure inside, and I'm going to compel you to look at it. <clears throat> now, we have to fight against this ourselves. Even if we've heard this lesson, even if we've partially learned this lesson, I suppose it will always be true of a Christian in this present world, in this present life. There's still a remnant of this kind of thinking in us that we have to fight against and reject it. It's this thinking that says, now hold on here a minute. Uh, the Lord wants us to go into the world and, and preach the gospel and make converts and so forth. Well, look, if anybody's going to look in the pot and find the treasure, we got to do something to dress up this flunky looking pot. It's all bright. Man. Nobody's going nobody's to be attracted to that. So we've got to. Uh, we got to decorate it some. We've got to do something. In fact, we better just find another fine porcelain vase to, to, put this, to put this treasure in. Now, how do we know that this is widespread today? Because, again, so many, well, look at what's happening in the churches today. Now, maybe uh, like, I got, that can happen to us here in this little church and can happen to people that are in a may, maybe be fortunate enough that you're in a, a good sound biblical denomination and, and, and so forth but we can be so wrapped up and caught up in our own little worlds that we don't understand what's really happening out in the name in the world in the name of Christianity and what's happening today it's been happening for quite a long time is that the churches and the pastors and the Christians are busy decorating the pot. They're, they're busy at work, you know, putting some kind of perfume on the gospel so it's not such a stink to the unsaved people anymore. And guess what happens? How, how does that happen? There, you all went, if you're going to try to change the gospel, if you're going to try to make the gospel less of a stench of death, you're changing the gospel. And Paul says that there is no other gospel. And if we go about doing that, we are anathema then, then b before, before God. <clears throat> if you're a Christian, you stink to the unsaved person. You're a stench of death. And the, the message of the gospel, that, it, that's, but to those that are being called, to those that God is drawing to himself, you are a fragrant aroma. And you're not going to be able to keep them away, you see. But it's only the gospel. Only the gospel, that treasure. There's only one power of salvation, Romans 1, and that's, that is the gospel. Um, well, we've got to make ourselves look less foolish. We've got to be more relevant. We've got to be more with it. You know? Are you talking about making the gospel more relevant? The gospel's relevant. Pretty much. It's a message about eternity, eternal death, or e eternal life. It's a pretty relevant message relevant message how are you going to make it more relevant really what we mean is we're going to we're going to make it more worldly we're going to make it more appealing to the lost so that it's not foolishness to them anymore T take a tour around on the internet on church websites just take a tour around of them and you'll see that i'm i'm not exaggerating this salvation is of the lord sinners are not saved by man's might or power or 
schemes. They're never going to look in the pot unless the Lord is calling them and compelling them to look. That's how the Lord then accomplishes his work. There's no exceptions to this. He, as soon as man starts boasting of his power and his might, as soon as a church is doing that or an individual is doing that, God's, oh, okay, what's God's response? Well, I'm done here. Nothing I can do here. I'm gone. You see, if you want to quench the spirit of God, the quickest way to do it is start boasting and trusting then in, uh, in ourselves. Listen to Paul again, 1 Corinthians 2. When I came to you, brethren, and by the way, these verses, this is Paul's philosophy of Christian ministry. And I, 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 the Lord knows I'm telling the truth here. Again, in all my years, and, and, and I went to a seminary that was conservative and supposedly biblical and so forth. But um, in all my years in seminary, the philosophy of Christian ministry, this passage was never elaborated upon. It was never Listen to what Paul says. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. There it is. M many people that think they're saved today, actually their faith rests upon a man and not, uh, not upon Christ, you see. That's the, that's the danger here. But again, as I said, not once did some like godly old professor who had been a, a pastor for years sit down and say now listen men you you know put away your phone <laughs> and listen up i'm telling you something here that you better get a hold of if you're if your intent in going into christ's ministry is because you want to be exalted, you want to have a big following, and you're here to learn how to speak in a superior and, and influential <clears throat> way, <clears throat> leave now. Leave now. Because Christ himself was weak when it comes to man's evaluation then of power. And if you're not ready to be broken <clears throat> and serve him in weakness and fear and much trembling, then all you're going to be doing is encouraging people to trust in you rather than in Christ. And it will be worse than, than a failure, even if you have a massive crowd following you, you see. <clears throat> For I will show him, Christ says to Ananias about Paul, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now this is who Paul was before that encounter. Philippians 3, finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord. <clears throat> to write the same things again is no trouble to me and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself, and here he goes, might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, 
As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. That's who he once was. But after that day on that road, he found out it was not. That's why he was blind and he couldn't even eat or drink for three days. This is like a giant trauma as the realization came across Paul. I've been persecuting God. I'm, I've been, I'm the chief of sinners. But that's who he used to be, an elite among the Jews. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Have you ever wondered, you know, in the parable in Matthew 13, the parable of the soils, <clears throat> we read this, verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's been sown in his heart. This is the one in whom the seed was sown beside the road. Now, <clears throat> as you think about that, have you ever wondered, well, how does he do that? I mean, we, we can understand how the seed is sown. It's the preaching of the gospel. But how does Satan come along, and he's just right on the heels of the preaching of the gospel, he comes along, somebody, it's not received, it's not understood, he's right there, he snatches it away. How, how, how does he do that? Well, <clears throat> one very common way is this. Here's Paul again, 2 Corinthians 5. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer. For those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. And then he elaborates later on, chapter 10. For they say, these are these enemies that had come into the church at Corinth, Satan's agents. And what did they say? His, that is Paul's letters, you know, they're weighty and strong. But look, look, you Corinthians, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. And that's how Satan does it. He comes along after, say, Paul, in this case, had preached the gospel. Satan and his agents, they come along. What do they do? They start demeaning Paul. They start, well, look, look at him, look at the guy. You know, okay, fine, his words or it might have been okay or whatever, but <clears throat> look at him. His bodily presence is weak. He, he doesn't appear to be, you know, his speech is not superior. He's not this great orator. Sometimes you wish you, we had a portrait, a, a real one of Paul, because you, you, you get the idea, you can get the idea as you read about the Apostle Paul in Scripture that he would have been pretty outwardly impressive or whatever you know we just start thinking that way P probably Paul wasn't impressive at all I mean he maybe he was some short little scarred up guy <laughs> that you wouldn't you'd say you just dis disregard him then he steps up to the pulpit and he's not a, a great orator and he's intentionally not being then a great order so what happens what happens when that enemy message is believed the true word of God and the true apostle of God are rejected and the liar then is embraced you see why because we're still holding on to the idea <clears throat> that it's by man's might and man's power don't even get me started on how churches go about uh, calling a pastor and have him come and candidate. Hmm, well, yeah, I noticed this about him and I see this about him and I see what kind of a suit he was wearing and this kind of a thing. You know, <clears throat> outwardly and, and it, well, what degrees do you have and all that sort of a thing. And so what happens? Well, if the Apostle Paul was candidating, he wouldn't be called. I'll go further. If Jesus himself was candidating, 
he would flow. He would be he would be disregarded. He wouldn't make the first cut then of the resumes. There is immense pressure upon us, upon any true church and any real Christian to conform to this world. You know, to borrow that phrase from the movie, if you build it, they'll come. No, they won't. No, they won't. You, oh, there might be lots of people that come, but they're not being called then. They're not coming because then of, of the Lord. <clears throat> I have known people before that profess to be Christians and so on, and uh, in, in help, trying to help them grow, I'd, I'd steer them in a, in a direction, you know, well, here's some good material for you to be, to be reading. And so, for example, and this has happened several times, uh, I'd say, you know, Martin Lloyd-Jones was a tremendous preacher. And he was not a tremendous preacher because he was so impressive in his speech and oratory. It's because he preached God's word and without compromise. And if you want to grow, you go, nowadays we say, go key into his podcasts on, on YouTube. But however you do it, <clears throat> get his books, listen to him preach. Pick out his series on Romans. Start in chapter 1, verse 1. It might take him three sermons to get out of that. But uh, listen to Lloyd-Jones. And I've had them come back and say, well, I, yeah, yeah, I did. I, I listened to one of his sermons. But, you know, I, I just don't like to listen to him. I, I don't like his accent and that sort of a thing. And so they reject. They reject a true minister of the word, and it's like, <clears throat> what do you think? What, what, what do you want then? So there's this great pressure on us. If you build it, you got you to build it. You got you to do it. And if you don't do it, <clears throat> they won't come. You got to have all these resources. You have to have all this stuff going on or... <clears throat> Or they won't come. You know what the truth of the matter is? The truth is, when the Lord is calling someone, and they come and they, they either to you or maybe they come to a, a church service. Maybe they've never even been in a church building, you know. But they come, and they come and they hear God's word. If it's the Lord that's calling them you won't be able to drive them away even if they have to sit on the floor. There's no, you won't be able to drive them away. And if you, if you know Christ yourself and you think back, maybe it's been a long time ago, but maybe you can remember that's how it was. That, that's how it was. I was going to have, I was going to have God's word. And I was going to, I had to be Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. I got to get rid of this burden. I have, I've got, to, I've got to keep, I've got to keep on because I've got to get rid of this burden of my sin, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. <clears throat> Many years ago, in our first church way up in the mountains of Montana, um, a man and his wife bought a nice ranch up north of us, and uh, and and I, I'd heard that they'd they'd moved there, but I'd I'd never met him. Until after they'd lived there a year or so, uh, one Sunday, he uh, came to our church. He came to a, and, and it was, uh, I think it, it, we'd been hit with a real heavy snow. And so he, he'd been going to church for a year up in uh, Kalispell, about 60 miles away. And he couldn't make it that Sunday. So he came down to our church service. And afterward, he came up to me and he invited me to go to Kalispell with him the next day. He had to go up there and get some building supplies and so on. And so, <clears throat> so I, I went along with him. And we hadn't gotten too far um, north on the highway when he told me, he said, I, I have to confess something to you. I've been a fool. I've been driving for a year, 60 miles, these mountain roads up to Kalispell to go to a church. I knew your church was there, but you're meeting in this old log community hall with a moose head on the wall. 
And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking any pastor that's going to be here, I mean, he, there's just not a lot to, to offer. And, and he said, he, he told me, he said, I've been stupid. I should have come here a long time ago because the church I've been going to up north hasn't been preaching God's word and you preached God's word this morning and, and I, he wanted to uh, apologize. Well, you see, the man had been used to big things. Uh, he, was, he was wealthy and as it turns out, he was James Dobson's cousin. So he had been used to big things and, and celebrity and, and so forth. And uh, well, a short time later, they maybe the next year they sold the ranch and it was too isolated for his wife and they moved on and I never, I never saw him again. But here's my point. That's how Satan works. He gets people to look at outward appearances and evaluate them by outward appearances. So he would drive clear up there and, oh, here's a big building and, and this is a typical happening church, part of a big denomination and so forth. So this has to be a true church. But he, he rejected the true and embraced the false. Listen, my beloved, James says, has not God chosen <clears throat> those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom which he's promised to those who love him? Yeah. The ultimate example, the Lord Jesus came into this world by all outward appearances as a nobody, a fool. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. We are saved by God emptying himself of glory and coming into this world as a lamb to be, to be slaughtered. How would you expect him to come? Oh, we expect him just like the Jews, a conquering king and power and majesty. He's gonna do that someday, but not the first time he came humble and mounted on a cult. Isaiah 53, of course, you can read that for yourself again, describes the suffering servant of the Lord. <clears throat> God will not save a boastful person. He will not work in a Christian who slides into boasting, and he won't work in a church that boasts of its own strength and power. He only works in weakness. His power is perfected in weakness. <clears throat> I put it, this is an anonymous poem I found the other day in William Hendrickson's commentary on Romans, and I put it on, on, on the blog this, this last week. Um, and it really describes, I think, what we're talking about here. It's, it describes a person who was who looked at being saved, at get, getting right with God, I've got to do it. I have to do it. And they learn the hard way, that's not going to work. So here's, here's this, this is, it's a great poem. Oh, long and dark, the stairs I trod with trembling feet to find my God, gaining a foothold bit by bit, then slipping back and losing it. Never progressing, striving still with weakening grasp and faltering will, bleeding to climb to God, while he serenely smiled, unnoting me. Then came a certain time when I loosened my hold and fell thereby. Down to the lowest step my fall as if I'd not climbed at all. And now, when I lay despairing there, listen, a footfall on the stair, on that same stair where I, afraid, faltered and fell and lay dismayed. And lo, when hope had ceased to be, 
my God came down the stairs to me. When I'm weak, that's when he saves. Father, we thank you for your mercy in Christ. Thank you for these great truths. We need to learn them constantly. We need to learn about our weakness. We ask your forgiveness, Father, for the times when we trust in ourselves and we boast and we go about our days as if we are adequate without you. Please forgive us and teach us so that we can see your power for your glory. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please take your Trinity hymnals, that's this red hymn book, and turn to number 32, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And if you're able, please stand. Amen. Mm-hmm.